Chapter Twenty Four of The Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red and the Black by Stendhal. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Twenty Four A Capital. What a noise! What busy people! What ideas for the future in a brain of twenty! What distraction offered by love! Barnave. Finally, he saw some black walls near a distant mountain. It was the citadel of Bessinson. How different it would be for me, he said with a sigh, if I were arriving at this noble military town to be sub-lieutenant in one of the regiments entrusted with its defense. Bessinson is not only one of the prettiest towns in France, it abounds in people of spirit and brains. But Julien was only a little peasant, and had no means of approaching distinguished people. He had taken a civilian suit at Fouquet's, and it was in this dress that he passed the drawbridge, steeped as he was in the history of the siege of 1674. He wished to see the ramparts of the citadel before shutting himself up in the seminary. He was within an ace two or three times of getting himself arrested by the sentinel. He was penetrating into places which military genius forbids the public to enter, in order to sell twelve or fifteen francs worth of corn every year. The height of the walls, the depth of the ditches, the terrible aspect of the cannons had been engrossing him for several hours when he passed before the great café on the boulevard. He was motionless with wonder. It was in vain that he read the word caf, written in big characters above the two immense doors. He could not believe his eyes. He made an effort to overcome his timidity. He dared to enter, and found himself in a hole twenty or thirty yards long, and with a ceiling at least twenty feet high. Today everything had a fascination for him. Two games of billiards were in progress. The waiters were crying out the scores. The players ran round the tables, encumbered by spectators. Clouds of tobacco smoke came from everybody's mouth, and enveloped them in a blue haze. The high stature of these men, their rounded shoulders, their heavy gait, their enormous whiskers, the long-tailed coats which covered them, everything combined to attract Julien's attention. These noble children of the antique Byzantium only spoke at the top of their voice. They gave themselves terrible martial airs. Julien stood still and admired them. He kept thinking of the immensity and magnificence of a great capital like Bessinson. He felt absolutely devoid of the requisite courage to ask one of those haughty-looking gentlemen who were crying out the billiard scores for a cup of coffee. But the young lady at the bar had noticed the charming face of this young civilian from the country, who had stopped three feet from the stove with his little parcel under his arm, and was looking at the fine white plaster bust of the king. This young lady a big franc comtoise, very well made, and dressed with the elegance suitable to the prestige of the café, had already said two or three times, in a little voice, not intended to be heard by any one except Julien, Monsieur, Monsieur. Julien's eyes encountered big blue eyes, full of tenderness, and saw that he was the person who was being spoken to. He sharply approached the bar and the pretty girl, as though he had been marching towards the enemy. In this great manoeuvre the parcel fell. What pity will not our provincial inspire in the young lycée scholars of Paris, who, at the early age of fifteen, know already how to enter a café with so distinguished an air? But these children, who have such style at fifteen, turn commonplace at eighteen. The impassioned timidity which is met with in the provinces sometimes manages to master its own nervousness, and thus trains the will. I must tell her the truth thought Julien, who was becoming courageous by dint of conquering his timidity, as he approached this pretty girl, who deigned to address him. Madame, this is the first time in my life that I have come to Bessinson. I should like to have some bread and a cup of coffee in return for payment. The young lady smiled a little and then blushed. She feared the ironic attention and the jests of the billiard players might be turned against this pretty young man. He would be frightened and would not appear there again. "'Sit here near me,' she said to him, showing him a marble table, almost completely hidden, by the enormous mahogany counter which extended into the hall. The young lady leant over the counter, 
and had thus an opportunity of displaying a superb figure. Julien noticed it. All his ideas changed. The pretty young lady had just placed before him a cup, some sugar, and a little roll. She hesitated to call a waiter for the coffee, as she realized that his arrival would put an end to her tete-a-tete -tete with Julien. Julien was pensively comparing this blonde and merry beauty with certain memories which would often thrill him. The thought of the passion of which he had been the object nearly freed him from all his timidity. The pretty young woman had only one moment to save the situation. She read it in Julien's looks. This pipe smoke makes you cough. Come and have breakfast tomorrow before eight o'clock in the morning. I am practically alone then. What is your name? said Julien, with a caressing smile of happy timidity. Amanda Binet. Will you allow me to send you within an hour's time a little parcel about as big as this? The beautiful Amanda reflected a little. I am watched. What you ask may compromise me. All the same, I will write my address on a card, which you will put on your parcel. Send it boldly to me. My name is Julien Sorel, said the young man. I have neither relatives nor acquaintances at Besançon. Ah, I understand, she said joyfully. You come to study law. Alas, no, answered Julien. I am being sent to the seminary. The most complete discouragement damped Amanda's features. She called a waiter. She had courage now. The waiter poured out some coffee for Julien without looking at him. Amanda was receiving money at the counter. Julien was proud of having dared to speak. A dispute was going on at one of the billiard tables. The cries and the protests of the players resounded over the immense hall and made a din which astonished Julien. Amanda was dreamy and kept her eyes lowered. "'If you like, mademoiselle,' he said to her suddenly, with assurance, "'I will say that I am your cousin.' This little air of authority pleased Amanda. "'He's not a mere nobody,' she thought. She spoke to him very quickly, without looking at him, because her eye was occupied in seeing if anybody was coming near the counter. "'I come from jean Lee near Dijon. Say that you are also from jean Lee, and are my mother's cousin. I shall not fail to do so.' All the gentlemen who go to the seminary pass here before the café every Thursday in the summer at five o'clock. If you think of me when I am passing, have a bunch of violets in your hand. Amanda looked at him with an astonished air. This look changed Julien's courage into audacity. Nevertheless, he reddened considerably as he said to her, I feel that I love you with the most violent love. "'Speak in lower tones,' she said to him with a frightened air. Julien was trying to recollect phrases out of a volume of the Nouvelle Eloise, which he had found at Vergy. His memory served him in good stead. For ten minutes he recited the Nouvelle Eloise to the delighted Mademoiselle Amanda. He was happy on the strength of his own bravery, when suddenly the beautiful Franck Cantoise assumed an icy air. One of her lovers had appeared at the café door, he approached the bar, whistling, and swaggering his shoulders. He looked at Julien. The latter's imagination, which always indulged in extremes, suddenly brimmed over with ideas of a duel. He paled greatly, put down his cup, assumed an assured demeanor, and considered his rival very attentively. As his rival lowered his glass, while he familiarly poured out on the counter a glass of brandy for himself, Amanda ordered Julien, with a look, to lower his eyes. He obeyed, and for two minutes kept motionless in his place, pale, resolute, and only thinking of what was going to happen. He was truly happy at this moment. The rival had been astonished by Julien's eyes. Gulping down his glass of brandy, he said a few words to Amanda, placed his two hands in the pockets of his big tailcoat, and approached the billiard table, whistling and looking at Julien. The latter got up transported with rage, but did not know what to do in order to be offensive. He put down his little parcel, and walked towards the billiard table with all the swagger he could muster. It was in vain that Prudence said to him, but your ecclesiastical career will be ruined by a duel immediately on top of your arrival at Besançon. What does it matter? It shall never be said that I let an insolent fellow go scot-free. Amanda saw his courage. It contrasted prettily with the simplicity of his manners. 
she instantly preferred him to the big young man with the tailcoat. She got up, and while appearing to be following with her eye somebody who was passing in the street, she went and quickly placed herself between him and the billiard table. Take care not to look askance at that gentleman. He is my brother-in-law. What does it matter? He looked at me. Do you want to make me unhappy? No doubt he looked at you. Why, it may be he is going to speak to you. I told him that you were a relative of my mother, and that you had arrived from jean -Lis. He is a franc Comtois, and has never gone beyond Dolion, the Burgundy Road. So say what you like, and fear nothing. Julien was still hesitating. Her barmaid's imagination furnished her with an abundance of lies, and she quickly added, No doubt he looked at you, but it was at a moment when he was asking me who you were. He is a man who is boorish with everyone. He did not mean to insult you. Julien's eye followed the pretended brother-in-law. He saw him buy a ticket for the pool, which they were playing at the further of the two billiard tables. Julien heard his loud voice shouting out in a threatening tone, My turn to play. He passed sharply before Madame Amanda, and took a step towards the billiard table. Amanda seized him by the arm. Come and pay me first, she said to him. That is right, thought Julien. She is frightened that I shall leave without paying. Amanda was as agitated as he was, and very red. She gave him the change as slowly as she could, while she repeated to him in a low voice, Leave the café this instant, or I shall love you no more, and yet I do love you very much. Julien did go out, but slowly. Am I not duty-bound, he repeated to himself, to go and stare at that coarse person in my turn? This uncertainty kept him on the boulevard in front of the café for an hour. He kept looking if this man was coming out. He did not come out, and Julien went away. He had only been at Besançon some hours, and already he had overcome one pang of remorse. The old surgeon-major had formerly given him some fencing lessons, in spite of his gout. That was all the science which Julien could enlist in the service of his anger. But this embarrassment would have been nothing if he had only known how to vent his temper otherwise than by the giving of a blow for if it had come to a matter of fisticuffs, his enormous rival would have beaten him and then cleared out. There is not much difference between a seminary and a prison, said Julien to himself, for a poor devil like me without protectors, and without money. I must leave my civilian clothes in some inn, where I can put my black suit on again. If I ever manage to get out of the seminary for a few hours, I shall be able to see Mademoiselle Amanda again in my lay clothes. This reasoning was all very fine. Though Julien passed in front of all the inns, he did not dare to enter a single one. Finally, as he was passing again before the Hôtel des Ambassadeurs, his anxious eyes encountered those of a big woman, still fairly young, with a high color, and a gay and happy air. He approached her and told his story. "'Certainly, my pretty little abbé,' said the hostess of the Ambassadeur to him. "'I will keep your lay clothes for you and I will even have them regularly brushed. In weather like this it is not good to leave a suit of cloth without touching it. She took a key, and conducted him herself to a room, and advised him to make out a note of what he was leaving. "'Good heavens! How well you look like that, Monsieur the Abbé Sorel,' said the big woman to him, when he came down to the kitchen. "'I will go and get a good dinner served up to you.' And she added in a low voice, "'It will only cost twenty sous,' instead of the fifty which everybody else pays, for one really must take care of your little purse-strings. I have ten louis, Julien replied with a certain pride. Oh, great heavens, answered the good hostess in alarm, don't talk so loud. There are quite a lot of bad characters in Bessinson. They'll steal all that from you in less than no time, and above all, never go into the cafés. They are filled with bad characters. Indeed, said Julien to whom those words gave food for thought. Don't go anywhere else except to my place. I will make coffee for you. Remember that you will always find a friend here, and a good dinner for twenty sous. So now you understand, I hope. Go and sit down at table. I will serve you myself. I shan't be able to eat, said Julien to her. I am too upset. I am going to enter the seminary as I leave you. The good woman would not allow him to leave, before she had filled his pockets with provisions. Finally, Julien took his road towards the terrible place. The hostess was standing at the threshold, and showing him the way.
End of chapter 24